All right, welcome back to a bonus episode of the Blasters and Blades podcast. So, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies, a place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. So without further ado, let me tell you what we're doing right now. We're getting ready to uh, release some of the archive that we found from when we were the sci-fi shenanigans. Uh, we're going to get those up there for, for the posts that were brought down. We thought you might enjoy them. Um, and so without further ado, let us uh, let us roll that beautiful... Oh, wait, they're going to sue me. Play it. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi fans. Time for your daily dose of insanity. Over here at the Sci-Fi Shenanigans Podcast with your hosts, Jared Handley and me, Chris Winder. Just two nerdy veterans out over a science fiction passion. A place where the sky's the limit, space is the place, and nerds run the world. Without further ado. All right, so today we have as our special guest, CJ Carrilla, who is a grew up in South America and bounced around uh, sorted parts of the U.S. after over 20 role-playing books for such companies Palladium as Palladium Books, Steve Jackson Games, and Eden Studios. He turned his hand to fiction and assorted genres from superhero alternative history to horror and science fiction. When not writing, CJ enjoys gaming, computer and tabletop specifically, reading and fighting crime, mostly by yelling at kids to get off his lawn. I approve of that, by the way. He does not enjoy long walks on the beach unless said beach has a partially burned Statue of Liberty. He was recommended to us by a fan of the show, Logan Scott, who's uh, also another author and um, combat veteran. So thank you when you listen, bud, for for making this thing happen. Uh, Today, uh, Chris is not able to be here. He's fighting those germs we talked about last week from the the kids at the school he works at. Dang, germ factories got him. So we apologize for that. But yeah, so it's just going to be me and CJ today, or CJ and I, I should say. I know my editor listens to. And then uh, as far as how we met, I've seen his books floating around on Amazon, but I hadn't bought any of them yet. My Honor Harrington fan club reading challenge had me prioritizing authors who were also members for the extra points. Hey, I'm competitive. What can I say? So when, um, when I was taking Mill SF, talking about military science fiction with my friend Logan, uh, he baited, berated me for not having read CJ's works, so I did, and now I'm hooked. So there we have it. The fir- uh, this is going to be recorded as a two-part episode. Part one, we'll talk specifically about the RPGs that he has written, and then part two, which will be aired on the Wednesday following publication, will be um, specifically talking about the uh, his, his written novels as opposed to. So if some of the questions seem a little bit repetitive, bear with us because he's answering from both perspectives. So without further ado, um, I've looked at some of your titles for your RPGs and I see that you have urban fantasy, Lovecraftian fantasy, and science fiction. Of the three, I found more titles by you that are science fiction than any other. So what is it about science fiction in particular that you love? Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Uh, now, as to science fiction, um, I guess I, I must blame my upbringing. Uh, my father was a huge uh, science fiction fan. He uh, had a huge collection of all the classics, your Asimov, Clark, uh, Highland. So I grew up reading those. Uh, and, of course, uh, watching TV, uh, I, I, I got to watch uh, Star Trek dubbed in Spanish uh, growing up in Venezuela. And uh, I'm also old enough to have watched the original screening of Star Wars Episode Four. Ah, yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> well, you um, must have watched it as an infant, I'm sure. Well, yeah, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't old enough to share or anything, but <laughs> but I was. I was. I was old enough to appreciate it. That's for sure. That's outstanding. Well, normally I ask the the, the dreaded religion question, so. Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? <laughs> uh, How'd you worry I, for a second? 
uh, how about we call them the Holy Trinity and uh, leave it at that? <laughs> so a diplomat too. I like it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I think they all fulfill different uh, different needs in in what I like to see in science fiction. So I enjoy all three. Okay, I actually do too. I pref- I started with Star Wars, but it was actually with the the what is now the books that are considered legend rather than canon. Um, and then my mom was like, well, why don't you just watch the movie? Cause I was homesick and I, I, I was waiting for my broken glasses to get fixed. So I was like, well, I can't read the books without the glasses. Cause my mom was like convinced it would make my eyes go cross. <laughs> so she's like, just watch the movie. So, and, and then it was all downhill from there or uphill, uh, I guess, depending on perspective. Yeah. Yeah. So what is your first memory of watching, reading, or playing specifically games in the science fiction genre? Well, um, again, I'm dating myself here, but uh, the the first uh, science fiction RPG I bought was Star Frontiers, which came out around uh, 1983 or thereabouts. Um, It was sort of like a Star uh, Trek-like game. you know, you, you had like all the different races and the gadgets and, and so on and so forth. Um, and it was it was a nice little game. Um, it, um, I stole a lot of material from it for my Curbs game, which is what I usually played. Uh, and besides that, uh, the Star Wars RPG was a huge uh, influence. Okay. I, yeah. So, um, of the two, which one was your favorite? The Star Wars RPG or the Star Frontiers? Oh, Star Wars, definitely. Yeah, they, they, it had a great uh, cinematic feel to it. it. Made you feel like you you were part of the movie. Okay, I um, I've played. Um, I think I mentioned this to you offline, but I've played um, two sessions of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, the second edition, and then the Dungeon Master moved, and life sort of got busy. Cause I live in a Navy town, so everyone's constantly rotated in and out if they're affiliated with the military, and so. Um, but I've missed it so much because it was so many great ideas. You could just toy with them in your head for, for you know, your own stories that it's – I'm looking into teaching myself how to be a dungeon master and starting my own group. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I'm actually running a game um, via Skype with people uh, across the country. So it's getting easier to do it nowadays. So do you – that's something I wondered about because I know Nick Cole is a friend of the show, ha- uh, plays a game on Skype as well with for Dungeons and Dragons. So having done them in person and done them on Skype, do you feel like you lose something doing it on Skype? Yeah, it's not. I mean, definitely it's not the same as having people across the table from you, but uh, but it's close. I mean, it's it's a lot better than the, the alternative, which was uh, you know uh, playing by chat which uh, takes forever because everybody's typing at the same time and whatnot. Um, and, of course, the, uh, even going even back even further, playing by mail, <laughs> that, that just didn't work. Yeah, I could see that, especially when certain letters got lost. Or if you, yeah. didn't, if you didn't like the answer, you could say it got lost. <laughs> exactly. So, so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, Skype is better than nothing. Um, and it, it does help people who, who can't, uh, you know, come together to uh, actually get some game. Okay. Now, when you play the tabletop games, do you use the miniatures or maps or anything, or just the paper and pen? Um, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll break out the minis, uh, especially if it's like a complicated uh, uh, fight where, where you need to really make sure everybody knows where everything is. But most of the time, we just, like, talk about it. Okay. That's one of the things I've been researching myself for. I'm a visual enough person. I learned all of the tactics I was taught that, you know, I sort of incorporate into the writing and the gaming and all of that uh, from sand tables, which is the military basically version of tabletop gaming, where it's like the 3D. Well, they call it sand table because it used to be made of sand on on a box that had basically a table where the sand box was lifted and you could shape the sand to be the terrain to match it. And then, you know, people would throw in model trees and cars and buildings and whatnot to represent the space where you'd be doing your mission. And so I do that. I, I find that helps me visualize it things a little better. So, oh yeah. But uh, when you do the minis, do you buy like the pre-made stuff or do you make them your own or just sort of whatever's handy? Uh, well, it used to be when, um, 
uh, my ex-wife uh, used to love painting miniatures, so uh, I got uh, a lot of those from her. Uh, but more recently, um, I just I just grab whatever I have. Uh, I even have some old Hero Clicks miniatures from uh, <laughs> from the old game, and I just like have here you be Wolverine and you be Colossus, and that's it. <laughs> I like that. It's whatever's handy. Yeah, it's it's very informal. When I use it for my writing, I use the little green army men in Legos. Mm. I mean, that's really all you're doing is you just want to be able to see what the corridors would be and what you'd see from what angle. and I mean, Exactly, that, whatever works. It doesn't have to be fancy. So how did your love of gaming um, translate into writing and designing your own RPGs? Well, um, it's funny. Um, I, I I mostly wanted to be a writer, just a fiction writer. Uh, so I was doing all this gaming, uh, and my uh, then girlfriend, eventual wife and ex-wife, uh, she said, "Well, you like gaming so much. You're getting rejections from uh, all the magazines with your fiction. Why don't you try some? Why don't you submit something to one of the uh, role-playing magazines?" I said, "Well, yeah, you know, I do spend a lot of money on this crap." Uh, might as well um, uh, see if I can get some money back. Uh, <laughs> I wrote an article for a role player magazine by uh, Steve Jackson Games. Uh, had like some like rules for superheroes at that point. They didn't have a superhero game and some martial arts stuff. Um, I take in uh, karate uh, when I was a teenager, and uh, I always been a big fan of uh, martial arts movies. So I came up with some ideas, some little rules, you know, using like movie tropes in in the game. Um, they didn't like the superhero stuff, but they liked the martial arts stuff. They published that, and then um, they called me and say if I was interested in writing a source book, and that was my first uh, game book. So for for the karate stuff, I grew up in the age of uh, Chuck Norris, so I still yes. remember <laughs> taking karate lessons at Chuck Norris Studios. Where every oh. every building had a little cardboard cutout of him and his uh his key. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, what is the um you think the single largest influence on your development um, of games when you when you write them? Um, well, game wise, I would say Steve Jackson games. Uh, their 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 little uh, generic universal role playing system was. Uh, they want to call my imagination. I, I played D&D for a while and uh, Gamma World, another ancient game. Uh, but Curb sort of like grabbed me because it felt more realistic uh, and at the same, I'm very flexible. Let me mix and match things, which is something I enjoy doing. Uh, you know, throwing a little horror in science fiction or a little science fiction in fantasy, that sort of thing. Okay. And uh, Gamma World, that's a, a sci-fi one? I'm, I'm thinking, I've heard it before. Yeah, it's sort of like a post-apocalyptic uh, setting, but it's very gone. So you have like mutant animals, you have, uh, uh, you know, weird rules for telepathy and whatnot. Uh, it, it, was a, it was a fun game. Okay, I'll have to check that one out. And um, all of the games and magazines that he mentioned, I'm, I'm keeping a running tally for all of you listeners. And I will list all of that in the show notes with links if you want to investigate it on your own. Um, and then at the end of the episode, uh, CJ will give us how you can find him. And that'll be in the show notes as well. So if, if it's stuff that he wrote and you're interested, you know, he can help you uh, track that all down. Um, so, but, um, so how, when you're writing your, your game development – how do you set up your character classes? Do you just sort of use the preset stuff or do you make your own? Uh, well, most of the games I, I play or I run um, tend not to have character classes. Uh, they're, they're more like point-based systems. So you sort of like are given a set amount of, of character points and you use them to buy the traits that you want for your character. So if you want a mage or a, you know, or a priest, you you buy the, the major priest package and so on and so forth. But you can mix and match. You can have a magician who knows how to use a sword or whatever. Um, obviously, you're not going to be as good as a dedicated uh, swordsman or a dedicated magician, uh, but it sort of balances out. Okay. So when you that's how when you write it. As a player, what's your favorite class or, or, or breakdown of um, if you use the point system? How do you, how do you prefer to play? Uh, well, I try to 
to get um, uh, jack of all trades types. Uh, you know, people who can do some fighting uh, and, and might have an, a utility ability on the side, like uh, either healing or magic or, or something along those lines. Okay. So I guess like a bard, uh, but like more like of a badass bard than the ones in on D&D. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that about the D and D ones. I always like the uh, the sword and shield kind of combo because it sort of fits my personality. So the the one oh yeah the, the one D and D game I was uh, was in that we met for two sessions uh, was using the D and D I think version two. And so when we did the character class uh, traits and I rolled, I got like a one for intelligence. So she let me re-roll and I managed a three. So. Okay. Yeah, my, my characters always somehow end up just the dumb jock, which is funny because that's not me. <laughs> well, that's the cool thing about role playing. You can uh, step out of uh, your comfort zone and do something uh, different. Yeah, I have found that there is some overlap, though, with personality traits of who you people are and the characters they've built. So the game we played, I had a friend of mine that was in. She's a real life uh, paramedic and then she's going to nursing school. So, of course, her character was the healer. You know, the veterans were all that they were in the group because there were a couple army guys in with us. We're all the the warrior classes. Although I wonder what that says about people that choose to be the thief. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes you get uh, some disturbing um, insights <laughs> into people. So um, in the in-game combat for the games that you that you write and you can answer how you play as well. How do you decide how that's going to work? The rules and guidelines as far as like the way to make. Um, your RPG is different from the others or your game different from the others. Yeah. Well, well, designing wise, um, I, I like, um, uh, the simulation element, you know, try to make it uh, feel maybe not realistic, but at least somewhat real, um, something that people who watch movies even can say, well, okay, that makes sense. Um, but uh, also keep it simple enough that it can flow and you don't get bogged down uh, on detail or, or figuring things out. I figure if you have to open the, the book in the middle of a fight to determine what's going on, uh, you've probably failed as a, as a game designer. I can agree. Uh, I just say I absolutely agree with that. That's one of the things that uh, at least version two was so confusing for someone who hadn't played before that that we had to keep going. So I, I can definitely appreciate the simple factor. Especially for noobs. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, and and the idea is make it fun, make make people get excited, and you know when they're rolling their their dice, they know what's going to, you know what might or might not happen, and uh, they have a, you know get invested on the outcome. Absolutely. Now, when you play your games, because you were talking about setting the mood with with the having fun and, and keeping it cinematic and realistic. So when you play, do you get uh, music in the background for mood, or do you just you know just go with it? I've done it a couple of times, but uh, yeah, most of the time it's just a bunch of guys around the table uh, just just talking. Uh, sometimes we stop in the middle of a game and start, um, you know, talking about other stuff. Uh, it's it's very informal. Okay. Um, so when you play, do you prefer? Um, and you've mentioned that you use the miniatures sometimes, but when it comes to actually playing, do you prefer the miniatures or just the paper and the dice for for your gaming? Um, I guess it depends on the kind of game. Uh, I, I I've played some very combat-oriented games, and for those, it, it was nice to have uh, a, a nice little square grid. Uh, I had one laminated, and I could use um, you know those markers and you know and erase stuff as, as things changed. Uh, so we could get very tactical. Uh, as of late, I, um, the more role-playing oriented games, uh, it's just the paper and the dice. Okay. I, yeah, I was I was trying to decide myself how to go, but I think even just when you describe like the map, it doesn't necessarily have to have the grid. But if you have a map of like whatever kingdom or, or whatever, just so you can visualize, oh, okay, well, I want to go here. This is how we would go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it does help you uh, uh, visualize things. Uh, and having a ni- nice map of the of the game world uh, is always great because then you can tell people, well, uh, this is you know it's going to take you this long to get there, and you can see on the map, yeah, that it makes sense. Uh, now, when you do your map, um, is there any special program you use to make it, or just hand sketch it on paper? Or? Uh, now I'm just being lazy and just sketching things uh, down. Uh, I 
bought the program years ago, and and it was I I, I for even forget the name, uh, and it was pretty good. But it, sometimes it took me longer to get through the program than uh, it would have just me writing something down on a piece of paper. Now, because I I need the visuals when I do the the writing, I I've made maps. Um, the CC three combat or no the. It's listed as CC3. It's a campaign cartographer. Um, it's actually pretty user-friendly, so it's really easy to use. And you can download um, the whole thing. They, they run sales periodically. But um, they have like just a dungeon crawl map where you can design it specific and you can buy it a la carte. Um, I'll get you the link for that if that's something you want to take a peek at. Oh, yeah, yeah, because I've actually been um, – yeah, I might actually use it for my current novel because I, I – I, I, Having a decent map of my world is probably a good idea. Well, the um, for the for the novel writing stuff, it gives it to you, I believe, as a JPEG. So you could actually use that in your books. And yeah, I'll get you that link when when the show's over, and I'll put it in the show notes oh, for the you. listeners because uh, it it helps. And then it, because you own the JPEG, it's not like copyrighted because you're designing it within the program. Like you could go to Kinkos or whatever the equivalent is, and you could actually print one up poster size if you wanted. Very cool. What is your favorite? Uh, obviously, you know, you're biased, you, you love your own stuff, but if it wasn't your own game, what is your favorite RPG that you've ever played? Your, your... Uh, uh, probably, uh, I'm going to go back to uh, GURPS. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very, uh, I mean, it's a little uh, complicated uh, for newbies, but um, it's, it's a decent system. It covers a lot of different genres, there is a lot of material out there a lot of game i mean uh, movie and book adaptations for it so there's a lot of stuff that uh, that's available for it it's it's a, it's a very nice well-rounded system okay now if um oh, let's see oh he, here it is all right so you've written we've mentioned that he's written several rpgs and i think it would help if i if i give a list i probably should have done that in the beginning but this is a learning curve for everybody but he's done the gurps martial arts book he's written gurps war against the Cathor Cator. did i pronounce that right yeah Cator, i think uh, but i i wouldn't um yeah don't don't swear by it <laughs> he did gurps voodoo the shadow war uh mercenaries for Pal- palladium's multi-genre rpg riffs uh pantheons for the same multi uh, megaverse for palladium's multi-genre riffs he did the riffs manhunter rpg um he ri- he's written his own it's uh cj Carella's witchcraft rpg uh, Armageddon's The End Times, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and Terra Primate. Now, Terra Primate, is that um, along the lines of like um, Planet of the Apes kind of vibe? It, it's exactly uh, uh, along the lines of Planet of the Apes. Okay, I was wondering because you mentioned long walks <laughs> on the beach if the, if the uh, Statue of Liberty is covered in sand. So, <laughs> and, um, and before I forget, he has Secrets of the Ancient is the uh, final RPGs that he's, he's written. So of all those RPGs, what was the the most fun for you to write? Well, I have to go with uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, I, I love the show. I was a huge fan. Uh, when uh, Eden got the license, I was uh, pretty much in nerd heaven. <laughs> now, did you, did you have to work with uh, Joss Whedon? I think he was the director of the show at the time. No, I never got to see, speak, or communicate in any way with any members of the production cast or anybody. Actually, nobody at all, because my editor worked with the uh, uh, license department. I never got to see oh, anyone. Man. If you're going to do stuff like that, that would be like a cool perk. Yeah, I know. Like uh, the the uh, owner of Eden, actually, I think he got to meet um, Amber. Um, I forget the girl who played um, Willow's girlfriend, and I'm forgetting her name, so I'm just like uh, suffering for senile dementia. <laughs> dementia. Yes. Um, did you did you base the game off the movie or the TV series it followed? Oh, the TV series. Okay. Uh, I basically watched like the entire. Um, at that point, I think they had like five seasons. I watched every episode multiple times, taking notes, um, and tried to make the game uh, feel as much as the TV show as possible. Okay. Have you seen the movie though? Oh yeah, yeah. I saw the movie. Uh, Back in the back in the day, actually, when it came out in theaters, again, I'm very old. <laughs> the The death scene at the end has to be one of the most iconic 
in movie cinematic history where he just spends like 15 minutes kicking the wall. If you haven't seen that people, you should, you should just check that death scene out on, on YouTube or something. It is, it's hilarious. So, yeah, I mean the the movie itself is not great, great, but uh, yeah, it has its moments. So we're going to pause real quick before we continue the, the interview for a word from our sponsor. They picked a fight with the wrong species, a nation at war, the United stars of America. Born in the conflagration of an unprovoked alien attack, the newest entrant to galactic politics took the few crumbs of hypertech gifted to it and ran with them, soon expanding over dozens of star systems and establishing a wide trade network, protected by its powerful navy and the dreaded warp marines. In a fight to the death, a single marine platoon tasked with protecting an embassy on a hostile alien planet, an embassy and the fragile human enclave around it that soon finds itself surrounded by armed mobs. Can the Marines at a ragtag band of civilian and Navy personnel survive long enough to be rescued? All right. Well, thank you for, uh, for that episode sponsorship today. Um, but now we're going to get back to talking to CJ Carella. Um, so what advice would you give for the uh, aspiring RPG creator? All right. Uh, well, first off, um, brutal honesty, do not quit your day job. Uh, it's, um, I mean, uh, at least based on my experience outside a few big um, companies and a couple middle-sized ones, uh, this is a, an industry for hobby hobbyists. Uh, it's not going to make you a fortune. It's not, it might, in most cases, it's not going to even pay you a living wage. Uh, that's the, the downer part of the <laughs> of my advice. Uh, now, from a uh, from a design thing uh, point of view, uh, play a lot of different games. Get a feel for uh, what other people have done. Uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel. And uh, concentrate on, on providing a fun experience for the players, because that's the only reason they're going to be buying anything that you produce. Okay, so the um, the market is obviously changing for RPGs. I've seen a lot of, and, and sorry, this was a an ad libbed question. It wasn't in the the prep that we sent you, but I've seen a lot of Kickstarters for RPG games. So is that um, something you think is going to change the industry? Maybe let. Uh, the creators have more of a living wage, or do you think that's going to make a difference? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. Actually, I had it. Uh, I had something. I, read, I wrote something for uh, for that very point for one of the uh, questions below. But uh, but yeah, uh, Kickstarter makes a huge difference. Um, uh, Patreon as well. Uh, it gives uh, indie writers a lot of um, of um, uh, extra choices that they didn't have before. And actually, that was part of the advice I, I was going to give. Yeah, Patreon and Kickstarter are your friends. Uh, they're, they're the only way you're, uh, for somebody who doesn't have a lot of credits to his name to uh, you know, start getting a little bit of income and um, uh, building an audience. Okay. So when, when new people are, are writing their RPGs, do you recommend they start from scratch or try to write in existing um, game universes? Uh, I would say try to uh, uh, collaborate in, in something that already exists to uh, get your name out there. Uh, don't do anything for free. Uh, that, that the crap about exposure is crap. You, you can die of exposure. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> so um, but yeah, try to get some credits. Um, you know, start with the smaller companies. Maybe see if you can write a, an adventure or or help. Uh, uh, get some credits as play tester. Uh, just get your name out there, and then eventually enough people will, will see your work, and you can um, you can then try to launch something on your okay. own. Now, when you do the uh, writing in existing worlds, um, is that something that's easy to get them to agree to, or or do you have to jump through a lot of hoops? Um, well, it, it depends on um, well, it depends on, on who owns the the intellectual property. Some people are, are very good about uh, sharing things. Uh, a lot of gaming companies do, um, you know, share game rules or, or let people use their game rules uh, 
as uh, as extras in in uh, an existing role playing game, and others are, are, are a lot more uh, particular about. Okay, that. now. The next part of the show, we have mentioned in the beginning that we were going to do a two-part show where we're going to talk about his Warp Marine series because I've read the first one and it was awesome and I'm getting ready to start the rest of the series. But is there any plans for you to write an RPG for, for your Warp Marine universe? Um, I would love to. Uh, right now, I haven't, um, I haven't given it too, too much thought. Um, I tried to do a couple of uh, role-playing oriented things for uh, the first series of novels I produced and they didn't do so well. So I've been a little shy about it. Uh, but hopefully in the future, I might be able to uh, try something. Now, would that be something? Because, you know, if somebody approached me, I'm going to say yes, just because I think it'd be cool. And I don't have the uh, the dog in the fight, so to speak. Whereas you having written RPGs, is that something you would feel if someone approached you that you would be willing to let someone else do? I'm just curious, or, or are you too attached oh, yeah. because you wrote them yourselves? No, no, I, I'm, I definitely would entertain a, a, an offer to for somebody to do the to do the game for me. Because uh, I mean, right now, uh, unless I think I have something that's going to be a surefire hit, I think uh, me writing an RPG uh, an RPG would be like taking right. a pay cut. So it's kind of like um, like yeah. I mean, I don't have the. Uh, I, I mean, I have only so much uh, writing time to at my disposal, so I need to concentrate on what's paying the bill. Okay. Now, you mentioned that your dad was a huge science fiction fan and that you grew up in Venezuela. So is the science fiction community uh, for gaming, or, well, excuse me, the RPG community in Venezuela different than than where you're living now? Well, uh, yeah, it was different in the sense that uh, it was essentially non-existent. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, my, my, my father was uh, very unusual in, in that sense. Uh, he, um, uh, most of his peers uh, didn't read very much at all and uh, hardly read any science fiction. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think things have, have changed. I know there are more conventions and whatnot in South America. But back when I was growing up, uh, before the advent of the Internet and the cell phone, uh, yeah, no, there wasn't... Uh, much science fiction at okay. all. Okay. I was just curious because um, I've made some friends with other writers and other fans of science fiction that are all over the globe now. So I'm always fascinated about how that's varied from country to country. Like I've got a, a friend that's in Sri Lanka that, that says it's still the author, Arthur C. Clarke is the what everyone aspires to be like for, for the sci-fi scene there, as opposed to, you know, what people are doing in the U.S. where I'm at or, or wherever. It just fascinates me how you know, the culture you come from influences what you like and what you produce as far as uh, science fiction and RPGs and all of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, definitely things are, have changed because I do see a lot more conventions in South America. But uh, yeah, back in the day, it was um, it was basically magical realism. I mean, if you like uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, you, you, would, you would find his books. But that was about okay. it. Um, so you think it was mostly the um, the advent of the internet that, that brought that change about? I think that uh, the movies um, have have made a lot of um, inroads. Uh, you know, now with uh, you have the Marvel uh, movies, so uh, there's a lot more exposure to the to the entire genre. That makes sense. So. Um, now that, that we've talked about specifically your RPGs, the ones you've written and, um, and the ones that hopefully will come out for your Warp Marines, because that could be fun. Um, what games are you currently playing, uh, aside from any that you potentially made? Uh, uh, right now I'm playing um, a, a friend's game. He actually wrote his own um, game system. It's called the Glory Road RPG. And it's uh, actually a class-based um, sort of D and D-like uh, fantasy. Okay. Um, I will get that from you when we when we finish. I'll go ahead and get that link for you. Is that for sale anywhere? Uh, yeah, that's actually available on um, uh, Drive Through Drive Through RPG. Okay, so if you haven't heard of that one, you can click the links in the show notes and um, and check it out. His friend will thank you. <laughs> so, what is it about this game that you like so much? Uh, well, I mean, it, it's it's a it's a fun game. It's crunchier than uh, traditional D and D, but uh, it um, uh, it has a um, 
an, an interesting magic system. I, I, I do like it, and it. Uh, it can be very deadly, which makes uh, for some excitement. Okay. Now, when you play, do you ever have – do you try to keep the characters alive to keep the game going, or will you char- kill characters off? Uh, it's, it's a thin line. Sometimes if uh, – uh, I have occasionally allowed characters to die when I'm, I'm the game master, uh, but uh, I'm not uh, uh, completely averse to uh, occasionally fudging a dice roll here or there. Uh, is to uh, to prevent a, a meaningless death, but don't tell my players I, say, <laughs> I said that. So, do you prefer to play just to play, or to be the dungeon master, game master? Uh, I like doing both. Um, being a player is is almost relaxing for me because uh, I have been in a situation where most people want me to game master, so I like the idea of just worrying about what my character is doing. So it's, I would say, 50-50. I know Chris uh, has uh, the theory that the people that are creative love to uh, to do the Dungeon Master. So although I've gotten, you know, we I understand where he's coming from because you get to create the world, the adventure, and all that. But I've met plenty of authors that say, nope, I just like to play. So I, I don't know. It's, all, it's always interesting to see how that comes down when, when we talk to individual players. So. When you um, when you do that the um, the RPG games, do you prefer like the fantasy based or um, I know you write specifically like the Mill SF, but when you when you actually RPG as a player, do you have a preference? Uh, yeah, I tend to favor um, either standard fantasy or or more urban fantasy. Like um, uh, I haven't played too many games of uh, Vampire the Masquerade, but that sort of uh, that sort of uh, Genre. Okay, the um, I, I've I've heard somebody suggest um on a blog that I read I don't even remember where but but that they as dun- they wrote fantasy though but that as the dungeon master they would create scenarios that they're testing to see how it would play out for their books that they write. Um, so I was wondering if you like played like um science fiction like you know space themed RPGs and tested things for your Warp Marines books. <laughs> Well, haven't haven't done work, Marines. Uh, I have to say, uh, but uh, I, I did uh, some things from um, from my previous uh, uh, fiction series in one of my games. Okay, I, I think it could be fun, if nothing else, to get sort of like the uh, the effect of crowdsourcing ideas. Oh yeah, and sometimes you do get some insights of like things that you thought were cool. Uh, when you came up with them, and then when you're running them in the game, uh, you realize, no, that's kind of corny, actually. Yeah, but uh, sometimes corny has its place. I- I'm a fan of of the cheesy oh, uh, yeah. sci-fi. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of B-movies out there that I-, I think are hilarious, and everyone's like, what are you smoking? So, <laughs> Oh, yeah. So with the... Um, this is going to be a little bit shorter episode, because I think um, with me not being an expert on RPGs, there are only so many questions I know to ask, but normally we ask at the end as we're wrapping the, um, an episode up if there are any scientific breakthroughs that you're 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 following. But since you're an art, we're interviewing you in your capacity as an RPG creator, we wanted to mix things up. So, what is new in the world of tabletop gaming that excites you? Uh, well, um, my my answer was going to be well, crowdfunding. Yeah, definitely uh, Kickstarter and Patreon uh, are. Uh, they already have to some degree, but they're continue. They're going to continue to revolutionize the uh, the whole industry. Uh, at this point, the stores uh, are all dependent on a single distribu- this major distributor. So that means that if the distributor doesn't pick up your game or doesn't buy a lot of copies, uh, uh, you're pretty much dead in the water. Uh, with a Kickstarter, you can get enough people interested to uh, to finance your first printing. And even make a profit if you're careful on, on keeping your cost down. So that's going to be a, a big a big difference. You can have a lot of uh, games that uh, aren't going to have mass appeal, but are viable if you can get like you know 500 people or even 200 people to to pay for the, the first copy of your book. Okay. Now I know that um, there's a lot of debate in the writing specifically world about like the role of piracy, et cetera. Is that a huge issue for the RPG side? Since now you have eBooks, you could get the PDF on a, on a Kindle reader instead of having to buy the hardback or paperback book or whatever. Yeah, that, that, that is huge. I mean, you can pretty much um, 
uh, if, if you're willing to go around and, 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 and do research, you can probably get free copies of pretty much anything. Um, and I mean, it sucks in some ways. I think I tend to agree with the people who say that most people who would pirate uh, your stuff weren't going to buy it anyway. And at least now they are familiar with your uh, with your work and might uh, at some point either buy it, buy some themselves, or even recommend it to somebody who might buy it. But uh, yeah, it's something that that happens. Um, I, I don't I, I don't love it, but uh, I don't lose any sleep over. Yeah, I um I tend not to think about it too much, but I, I agree. Um, well, first off, most of the um most of the sites that are selling it are actually just trying to get you to enter your credit card and, and be a sucker so they can rob your right. mind. But yeah, I don't I don't know that those people would have bought it anyway. I just wasn't sure how that affected the RPG. Um, oh, it's pretty bad. I mean, a lot of people are are, are up in arms about it, and they. They believe that one reason that sales are flagging is because of piracy. I'm not sure that is the case, but I mean, I can understand why people would be upset. Absolutely, I, I it's a complicated issue. I think um, as the the person that you know never really favored much in the way of, of stealing, <laughs> uh, I definitely right. I definitely understand why people get upset. But at the end of the day, you only have so much time and energy. Yeah, exactly. So, if um, if you had any game uh, RPG universe created in a in a science fiction series that you like, what would you pick? One that doesn't exist already. Oh, um, I know that's an on the spot, but but you give it, yeah. you're making me <laughs> yeah, think. Exactly. They actually have made yeah, they've made so much stuff now that it's almost hard to pick a, um, a science fiction show that they haven't made a uh, a TV show. Uh, I mean, uh, a game about it. See, offhand, I would say, uh, I'm, now I'm blanking on the actual name of the show, but uh, there's a lot of good stuff on, on the sci fi channel that I think would, would make a, a decent uh, RPG. Normally, when I answered that, I would have said like the Four Horsemen because I've enjoyed the way they treated the Four Horsemen novels. I've enjoyed the way they treated the mech stuff or the, um, the Galaxy's Edge by Jason Onspach and Nick Cole because I like the way they the stormtroopers that actually hit what they're aiming at. But uh, I, I was trolling uh, Facebook while we were waiting to start the show and it looks like both of those universes are working on that already. So it seems like all the cool ones, people have already saw the potential and started. <laughs> yeah, see, that, that, that's my, my, my exact same problem. Yeah, I think Galaxy Edge would make an excellent uh, RPG. Uh, and, and knowing Nick, I'm sure he yeah, I'm sure he has he had thought about it. I mean, I don't know him personally, but knowing how he uh, uh, markets his stuff, he probably had plans for it uh, even as he was writing the book. Now, that's a good question. I'll have to I'll have to in you know what? I'll tell you what. When uh, if that RPG comes out, we'll interview him and you could be a guest host and pepper him with questions <laughs> as our expert witness. <laughs> Oh, that'd be awesome. So, well, now now it's official. We'll have to do that. But so, so this is the part of the interview where I ask you, uh, CJ, where they can find you, and um, or at least the one you're the most active on, because we'll list all of them in the show notes. Well, the the ones uh, to really uh, go to are uh, my website uh, www.cjcarella.com and my Facebook page at uh, facebook.com/cjcarella. Outstanding. And he's very um, responsive on his Facebook page, people. So if you want to nerd out over his books and, and his author page is, is active too. He answers questions and comments and stuff there. That's that's how I got in contact with him. So it's definitely worth doing. And if you want to know where you can find us, we are at, for our website, www.sfshenanigans, Sierra Foxtrot Shenanigans.com. Our Twitter is Sierra Foxtrot Sierra, SF underscore show. And our email is podcast at sfshenanigans.com. All right. Thank you for sticking with us through that uh, archived episode that was in the uh, in the digital memory hole that we found. We thought you'd enjoy it. So thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the archive for the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back at our regular scheduled time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom.